Welcome back, everyone, to Inside Academia, the weekly program where we take a look behind the ivory curtain, seeking a frank discussion of American education. I'm your host, Andy Nash. My host today is Dr. Robert Weisberg. Dr. Weisberg is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Illinois. He's also the author of a number of notable books on politics and pedagogy. He's also published in leading professional journals and popular outlets and written articles regularly for the American Thinker, Family Security, Matters, and others. He's also authored 11 books, and his latest book is Bad Students, Not Bad Schools. He's been teaching uh, as a professor since 1969 at Cornell and most recently at NYU. Dr. Weisberg, welcome back uh, for our second interview with you on Inside Academia. Happy to be back. And I'd like to ask you a little bit about higher education this time around and uh, your decades-long experience in higher education. Since you started teaching, uh, and I presume you, you, you began teaching political science in, in the right. late 60s, Always that, right? That's right. right. Yeah. Okay. That was a time when, when, when there was a lot of turbulence within academia uh, in the early 70s with universities starting to become politically radicalized uh, with the Vietnam War and everything. But what was it like? What was the academic culture like uh, at that time, and how did it change throughout the course of the subsequent years and decades? When I entered the academy, which was actually as a graduate student in 1965 at the University of Wisconsin, which was also a very tumultuous place, we had riots on campus, politics among professional academics was not a big deal. Um, nobody really looked at people through the lens of politics. Back in those days, I was an airhead liberal, like so many of my colleagues, but we didn't take it all that serious. So, for example, we might say, hey, you want to have lunch? Say, yeah, let's have lunch. Okay, let's invite the radical Marxist along. He's good. He'll come for lunch, too, okay? It wasn't really important, okay? And, you know, the radical Marxists came, and maybe we invited a reactionary to come along with the thing. No big deal. Politics was not important. What happened was, gradually, the political agendas infused the faculty. We began, for a variety of reasons, hiring people where, whose political views were central to their identities. Okay? For them, the university was not a place where you come and learn, have fun, reading books, writing papers. It was a place that you captured so that it transformed society. And so things like faculty promotions, hiring, curricula, became political decisions. The university was politicized. How did, it, how did it get that way with respect to hiring decisions? Well, I would say that the biggest single thing was affirmative action. There. I spit it out. When you brought into the uh, university uh, women and African Americans, many of whom had a real clear, not all, had a real clear political agenda, uh, they were able to drive the, agenda, their, the university agenda in the direction of politics. So, for example... Uh, when I left Illinois, what we had were poly a lot of classes on what you might call African-American politics, Latino politics, uh, grievance issues, feminism, and things mm -hmm. like that. Okay? Because oppression the university politics. Was, hmm? oppression politics. Yeah, the university was being transformed from a place where people of all kinds of oddball persuasions could get together and discuss things that really were important to an army to conquer the culture and transform American society. Certainly there seemed to, to be a, a transformative role or purpose that was uh, adopted by many in the universities. And in fact, many people today would think the role of education, along with the role of journalism, is to necessarily transform society, to change and, society, and, and to advocate for social issues, rather than to simply interpret uh, reality as it is out there and analyze it. But with respect to your comment in particular, you mentioned, well, African Americans and women getting in university. So is it particularly the rank and file of the faculty uh, becoming more and more predominantly diversified biologically that you're saying was the problem, or what exactly was the issue? Let me give you a how part of this happened. This is what I saw with my own eyes. The University of Illinois like many, many schools in the United States, the real heart and soul of the university is over in science and engineering, places like that. That's where the real money is. Okay? Political science, sociology, history, and stuff like that is child's play. Okay, We, get, we got enormous hundreds of millions of dollars from the government for research in those areas. And that's what was really important. There's an old... Uh, um, 
war movie with the title called We Were Expendable. And the social sciences and humanities are expendable. So here's what happens. Some bureaucrat will come in. I've actually lived through this. And they will say, we've looked at your faculty here. You're, you, it's too, too many white males. You don't have enough diversity. Okay? Now, the dean sits down with the other dean and says, well, we're not going to diversify fields like physics and engineering, you know, and, and all those fields. That's very, very difficult. Okay? Uh, very difficult. But where can we diversify to the school? Real simple, political science, sociology, history, anthropology, okay? So the word comes out. I remember these words coming out. The, the dean will show up and say, you guys got to hire, you know, yeah. a member of an unrepresented group. Now, to encourage you to do that, we're going to pay that person's, half that person's salary for the next three years or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or we'll pay it all or something like that. Make a deal, okay? Now, this is like a mafia order. You know. <laughs> the dean shows up, and you know full well, you better cooperate. You better cooperate. Because if you don't cooperate, bad things are going to happen. It's not exactly you're going to have a fall down the stairs or something, but you're not going to get money. Sure. Moreover, it's free money. So you begin to hire these people, and they bring with them a political agenda. Now, and nobody stop really there. wants to stand up to it. It's clear that many did come to the, to the academy with a political agenda. Mm -hmm. However, uh, many would argue with you, though, that they would draw a distinction. They would say just because somebody is of a certain background or part of a minority group, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a political agenda. And even if they do, uh, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be able to go to college or be part of the professoriate. Uh, in fact, if anything, we should diversify it, but at the same time, retain, emphasize, and encourage intellectual diversity and truly have that type of academic, intellectual type of climate that you had when you invited the radical and the reactionary to the same lunch table back when you were a student. Uh, so let's distinguish between simply the, the, the biology of, of diversity versus the intellectual diversity. Well, you're is saying it, that it, they're one and the same. Well, no, there's a key word here which, which, which solves this problem. That word is professionalism. Okay. Okay. Now, the older faculty that I knew when I first went into the academy had a real strong sense of professionalism, um, that whatever their political views were, and some of them had very strong political views, okay, uh, those political views were checked when they went into the classroom. Uh, they, now, every once in a while, something would leak out, okay, you know, an offhand remark. I used to pride myself on my kids not knowing my politics. I taught the basic class in American government, and I had, at one point, um, as many as 1,400 students. Now, one of the exercises I used to do when we had a, uh, in a presidential election that year, I would ask for a show of hands, how many people thought I was going to vote for the Democratic candidate? And all kinds of hands would go up, okay? How many people think I'm going to vote for a Republican candidate? All, you know, usually a few more hands would go up than Democrat, but a lot of people raise their hands on both sides, okay? okay? Now, I consider that a great success. I was right. very proud of that, okay? That nobody really knew. Now, of course, today with Google and all that, it's e easier to find out. But a sense of professional responsibility was you taught the subject professionally. You didn't, you didn't transform the classroom into a bully pulp pulp pulpit yeah. in which you were going to proselytize now, I had a colleague uh, who also taught this American government class. I taught it in the fall. He taught it in the spring. He was an ideologue. He really believed that he was to be a preacher converting the heathens. Mm -hmm. And he actually showed up in class with his favorite T-shirt, a uh, picture of Bush. I forget exactly what it was. And it said, this is a professor, it said, fuck the president. Now, I always wore a suit and tie, and I was very careful to be balanced, and I never said anything bad about anybody. It's a sense of professionalism. It's like going to a doctor. I mean, the doctor doesn't give you a political lecture. He tr shouldn't give you a political lecture. He treats your illness. And I think that is the big change. You brought people in who lack the professional ethos. And there's where the change occurred. So the problem is not that they were women and minorities. Oh, that's it's, it's, it. it's the fact that they they thought they saw their role 
as to transform society by way of the educational institutions. And uh, they, in the process of doing so, many of them uh, abrogated that degree of right. professional. Right. Let me give you how, how that comes up. If you, I was a member for 30, 40 years, 30 years, of the American Political Science Association. Uh, a typical academic type of organization. Now, Political Science Association always has subgroups. Now, there are people who study communist systems, and they have a little group, and they meet, and stuff like that. People yeah. who study political theory, they have their group. Okay? What happened in, in the um, professional organization was the creation of advocacy groups. Okay, Now, these were the professional organizations were studying professional matters. The advocacy groups, for example, were talking about hiring more of their type, transforming the curriculum. So the women's caucus would get together, and they would hash plots on how to hire more women, mm -hmm. okay, or how to insert uh, women's courses into the curriculum. Rest assured, when the group studying ancient political theory got together, okay, <laughs> they may talk about, you know, why it was important to teach political theory, but they didn't have schemes to, 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 to get people in that area hired. Yeah. There's a the difference between academic professionalism and politics, and the people who came on board in the late 60s and 70s viewed the university as a place to transform society. And anecdotally, at, at Penn State University back in uh, in the early 2000s, there was a huge uh, uh, protest. A, one, a black student leader was uh, ended up getting a racial death threat. The FBI never found who did it, but it was nonetheless serious. And there was a huge sit-in demonstration taking place in the student union building that went on for several days, went on for a couple weeks. And it got national news, it was on CNN and everything. The black student leaders at the time had demanded that every student at the university be forced to take, as part of graduation, a African American studies course. Because they felt that strongly that in order that this is what they needed to do in order to avoid racism in the future. If they only understood us, there would be less ignorance and so on and so forth. But that of course politically means, you know, more uh, teachers that will teach that, more job opportunities for the people that do that. Right, right, right. Um, so there's a political component to that, even no, no matter how much they believe that this was the right thing to do. So, um, look, I personally, I'm not opposed to having an African American studies major or a Vietnamese studies major or any major, if you will, as long as it's done intellectually, honestly, and it's just as equally as academically rigorous as studying about Shakespeare or Aristotle or Plato. Uh, but at the same time that that's true, uh, if I feel, I do feel as though that there's a lot of political agendas that are coming to the table with a lot of this stuff, and people aren't able to retain the professionalism as you alluded to in the beginning. So, um, how do you? I guess going forward, we're a diversified country, diversified world. There's nothing wrong with studying about other cultures. How do we bring back the sense of professionalism, intellectual honesty, and not the political axe driving that that's going on? in a lot of these oppression politics studies courses. My view of this is that, and I used to be in business for 13 years, running. A, I owned and ran a business, that it has nothing to do with owning a diploma, okay? It has to do with the kinds of character these people have. For example, showing up on time, not leaving early, doing the work as it's supposed to be done, uh, following instructions, um, learning new skills on the job, constantly upgrading yourself, okay? My feeling is that this the lack of these skills is an explanation of why Amer many American industries go abroad. I've had re relatives who tell you, well, you know, I love America. I love America. I had a factory here in the United States, some of my relatives. But well, you know what happens? They don't show up half the time, okay? Or they're so diff they're so difficult to manage, it's just not worth it. And so I can ship the thing to China and do it for a fraction of the money, or put it in, put it into Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, uh, there's no, there's no consequences for this because the government will bail you out. Yeah. So it's like a kid who constantly screws up. And yeah. I remember a couple of years ago, the NBA put in a. A lifetime suspension if you were caught taking drugs. Mm -hmm. And one of the players I remember from Michigan was a guy named Roy Tarpley. You may not remember who he was. He was playing for the Dallas Mavericks with six lifetime suspensions. Now, what was the message? Lack of employment will sharpen the mind, and you'll say, you know, I got a job. You know what? I'm going to show up, and I'm going to dress appropriately, yeah. and I'm not going to argue with the boss. I'll do all these things. 
Uh, education does not encourage those skills. Even though it should, but it doesn't. Dr. Robert Weisberg, thanks again for joining us today. This has been Inside Academia. I'm your host, Andy Nash. Uh, check us out on the web, insideacademia.tv. Join us again next week, as every week, as we take you for a look behind the Ivory Curtain.